Okay, we're getting ready to start. Um, for your information, this webinar will be recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording. We'll also post it on YouTube and we'll send you a link to that too. So with that, I would like to introduce you to our um, speaker today, Rick Taro, who is one of our uh, big data architects at IBM. And the topic today is introduction to Spark Structure Streaming. So Rick, whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks, Anna. You can see my screen okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. All right, so today, w welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about a new library, a newer library for Spark called Structured Scre Streaming. So what we're going to cover today is I, I want to at least go over some Spark basics. And now we've had a number of webinars, and, and so this is not meant to be an introduction to Spark, but I want to make sure that we have you know some concepts at least in, in, the, in the top of our mind as we go through this to help make the rest of the presentation make sense. I'm going to talk very briefly about IBM's data science experience platform, which is the platform that I'm going to be running uh, the demos on. I'll just kind of give you just a brief introduction. Again, there's been other webinars that went deep dive into data science experience, and that's not the purpose here, but just to kind of briefly tell you what it is again. Then we're going to talk about uh, Spark streaming, and there's different processing engines. There's the you know the the older version of Spark streaming, and I'm going to introduce to you and, and make the, the you know the rationale of why you know structured streaming is now being introduced. And then we're going to go through, depending on the time, uh, two examples. One is more of a basic example to kind of get everyone to understand exactly what it does from a from a, a lower level standpoint. And then if we have time, I put together a, a more advanced demo that goes through looking at streaming sensor data. And then we'll wrap up. I'll give you some conclusions and, and if there's any outstanding questions at that point. So just to kind of, again, place Spark streaming in the context, you know, Spark is a you know, distributed computing framework and it has a number of uh, various libraries that make it very powerful. And again, on some of the other webinars, um, you know, we've touched on things like Spark SQL and, and machine learning and graph processing. And again, in this one, we're specifically going to be looking at Spark streaming, although I will take advantage and you will see we will use Spark SQL uh, within some of the demo environments. Uh, and the other thing I just want to point out on this page is it can support me you know, as you, those of you who have looked at and have worked with Spark in the past, you know, all various types of languages. In this particular, the demos that I'm going to do to instantiate the examples will be using Python. So just a quick review on some of the Spark ab abstractions out there. So the original Spark abstraction that came out when, when Spark was first introduced was this concept of resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs. An RDD is a distributed collection of objects, all of the same type, that can be operated on in parallel. Um, they're immutable, but you can transform RDDs into new RDDs in order to create like a pipeline to do the workload that, that you want. A little bit later on, when um, a little bit at the time after Spark SQL was introduced, um, this this abstraction called data frames then became available in Spark. And data frames is takes the RDD concept, but it, it, it organizes the data into named columns. So conceptually, this would look like for those who are familiar with relational database, it would look like a table in a relational database. Or even those who have worked or have familiarity with R and Python, it has a data frame construct. And this looks and smells uh, pretty much like a data frame does in, in those particular uh, frameworks. Data frames itself make the, the programming, it makes it simpler, easier to understand, easier to, um, you know, to develop against, again, kind of going back to the SQL paradigm and, and the, uh, you know, the ease of use it is to, to actually extract data and use and manipulate data using SQL. The other thing is that when they introduced data frames, um, Spark also introduced a new optimizer called Catalyst, which allows the Spark processing to occur in a more optimized fashion. So you can see the graph down in the bottom right hand corner which showed processing times and in this graph, smaller is better. Um, that they were able to make significant optimizations with data frames because the Spark engine knows more about what's going on. And so the stuff that we're going to talk about, because as, as you'll see, structured streaming is 
built upon data, the data frame uh, construct that will be able to take advantage of those optimis excuse me, optimizations also. So just a few brief uh, words on data science experience. Again, this is the platform that I'm going to be using for the demo, but just wanted to give you a few words on it here. So data science experience is IBM's collaborative platform uh, for data science. At the core and underlying is a, a Spark processing engine, and then you can get at that this, the processing engine through a variety of interfaces. The one that we're going to explore here in the demos is using Jupyter Notebooks, which I'll talk about uh, more in a minute. Uh, but it provides the capability to collaborate through projects um, and also the ability to kind of share your work. So if you go in and you can see the URL here, you can sign up um, you know, for a free trial account. There, in, within there, there are tutorials. Um, there are examples of other people's notebooks um, that you can look at to kind of get a head start in your learning and using, um, using Spark. So what I'm going to be using for the demo, and again, this is one of the interfaces that's provided in Data Science Experience, is Jupyter Notebooks. Um, for those who are familiar with it or who haven't come across it, it's, it's a browser-based document, basically, where you can intermix code, and then you can mark up the code by providing language around it that describes what you're doing. You can bring in graphics, and it, it's, it, it allows you to actually iterate through the code in an interactive manner, which makes development easier. Um, it makes it easier to explore data um, for data scientists, uh, and it, this is, again, the, the paradigm that you'll see that we'll be using in the, uh, in the demo. So let's talk a little bit about Spark streaming. So Spark has had a, a streaming component for several years, and I'm going to refer to this as classic Spark streaming. So this is the one that was already pre-existent. This is my term. If you go on like the official documentation, apache.spark.org, um, you will not see the word classic. They would just refer to it as Spark streaming, and then the version that I'm going to be talking about, they just refer to as structured streaming. But in order to make it a little bit more explicitly clear, I'm, I'm referring it to myself as, as, as classic. So in Spark Streaming, data streams in, and then there are these receiver processes on, on Spark that take the data and chunk it up into batches based on a time interval uh, which you define. And then the Spark Engine will, can go ahead and do processing against that, transformations or whatever you're doing it, whatever you want to do against that data. And then out the other end comes more, um, you know, batch process, uh, batches of that data that are now transformed. And we had a webinar on this uh, two weeks ago that used this uh, classic Spark Engine. So you can refer back to that uh, for more details on it. In classic Spark streaming, in addition to like the RDD abstraction that we already talked about, there was introduced another abstraction called discretized streams or D streams. And as you can see in the picture on the bottom, under the covers of a D stream are really these RD, are RDDs, but they're broken up into these, these chunks uh, based upon the time interval that you specify. The other thing I want you to come away with this, and this is true not only of classic Spark streaming, uh, but also of the structured Spark streaming that I'll be talking about, as a Spark streaming is a micro batch or mini batch, however you want to term it, architecture. So it, it does not do record by record processing. There are other streaming engines out there uh, in the industry um, that, that allow you to do that. But for most cases, um, you know, this is good enough. And again, the big strength with Spark is not only the fact that it has these streaming engines, but that these streaming engines exist within a framework that has all of the other engines. It has the SQL, it has the machine learning, it has the graph processing, and they can be used together, which is really one of the, the major strengths of Spark, to have that, that kind of breadth of capability all in one framework. So why do we need a new streaming, uh, a new streaming library? So what's wrong with the classic Spark streaming? First of all, the way that it works today with these D streams and the, the, the discretized streams APIs that I talked about, although they're similar to the APIs for working with RDDs, they are not exactly the same. And so you need to make modifications and the queries that you write and transformations that you write against RDDs will not necessarily work against D streams. The second thing is, as there's no support in the classic 
streaming, uh, Spark streaming for event times. And so although you can do this, it's not explicitly easy and that you have to, you know, it, just all the functionality is, is not built in. These streams are really based upon batch times, when the, the data actually arrives at the Spark receiver, as opposed to uh, event times that you could embed within the data. And as you see as we go forward with this, structured streaming makes it much more easier to work with e event times. And this enables the ability, um, which again, which is more difficult to do in the, in the classic streaming, to work with like late data or data that arrives out of order because it's, it's not, it's not tagged in any way uh, with, an, uh, with an event time. And finally, in, in classic structured streaming, there are no end-to-end -end guarantees in terms of the data. If you know, Typically people in streaming processing want once, uh, exactly once processing. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's complex to do in the classic streaming, and you basically have to handle all of the complexity of that in your code, whereas we'll see um, that's built in for you and taken care of for you in, in structured streaming. So what is structured streaming? So it's a it's, it's scalable fault tolerance stream processing engine, um, and it's built on the Spark SQL engine. So again, where classic streaming was built on RDDs essentially with, the, with that, with that DStream uh, additional abstraction, structured streaming is built directly on the data frame, uh, the data frame capability. And so it, that provides a number of, of things. Number one, it, it provides that optimization that we talked about, but probably more importantly, it provides the ability to have a consistent API so that you can work with data, static data, using the data frame APIs to express you know, aggregations and, and event time windowing and all of these things in the same manner that you can do on a, on a static data frame. So you can write a query once and you can run that same query and analyze both static data and uh, streaming data using the exact same, the same type of query. And then as we also mentioned, it provides the um, exactly once fault tolerant guarantees through checkpointing and uh, write ahead logs. We're not gonna go into a lot of detail on that, but again, I just wanna stress the point that that is taking care of you without you having to do anything about it. So what's structured streaming in a, in a nutshell? So it provides fast, scalable, and these are the things we would expect um, you know, out of any Spark library. Uh, fault tower end-to-end processing, which we, we already talked about. But again, the big thing I can't stress enough is that you get all this without having to worry about it. You need to reason about streaming. You work with the streaming data frames the same way, if those of you who have been using Spark, the same day, way you would with a, with a static data frame. And all that stuff you can think of as just being taken care of for you under the covers without you having to worry about it. So conceptually, you can think of uh, a, you know a data a structure streaming as provided this unbounded table. So as data streams in, you can think of the data being appended uh, at the end of this this unbounded table. And if we look at this from a from a programming viewpoint, you can imagine. You know, you have a data coming in, and then we're going to investigate it at various points, at trigger points. Uh, and and what you can see here in that in that first uh, column with the with the windows, uh, you can see that the, you know, with the I'm sorry, with input, you can see as the data comes in at time t1, you're going to have all the data up to that time. At time t2, you're going to have all the data that had would come up up to that time, and at time t3 all the data that would have come in up to that, streamed in up to that time. Again, that idea of the conceptually unbounded, uh, unbounded table. And then you can do transformations, aggregations, whatever it is, and at each of those times, you're gonna get the results of the data that, that had arrived up to that point, up to that point in time. And then that data can then be output, sunk to some uh, to some sync, which 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 could be to a you know whatever it is to a file, uh, it, and as we'll see eventually to things like relational databases and and so forth. So what are the data sources that structured streaming supports out of the box today? So this is as of Spark 2.1.0. There are a few of them. One is a file source, um, and this is the one we're actually going to use in the, in the demo. Um, so as data is written, in, written into a directory, Spark Structure Streaming can pick up the pick up the files as they're dropped in 
Uh, you can see there's a number of uh, supported file formats. Um, the one that we're going to be using is, is Parquet. Uh, and then as the files are atomically placed into the given directory, Spark Streaming will pick them up. So we're, in this case, we're going to be simulating a streaming environment. As files drop in, um, they're picked up as, um, you know, as streaming uh, files or uh, streaming data by Spark Structured Streaming. Uh, Spark Structured Streaming also, as of 2.1, supports Kafka. Uh, a message queue uh, the, uh, as a um, you know as a source for the data, and then there's another one, a socket source, probably not very relevant to us. It's really only used uh, for testing. It's, it runs on the driver, and and so not really meant for for production. In terms of output syncs, there are a number of pre-built output syncs provided. Again, as of as of version 2.1, um, there's a file sync, so you could write the output of the um, the you know the output of the transformations on your uh, on your um, streaming data frames uh, to a file. Um, this is a for each sync, uh, for which those of you familiar with um, you know the current streaming, the what I'm calling classic streaming, that would be similar to the way that that works. Um, there's a console sync, so you could write the output to the console. And then the one that we're actually going to use for purposes of this demo is this memory sync. Um, so this memory sync allows you, and this, this runs on the driver, the Spark driver, and, and it allows a, an in-memory table that you can then go ahead and investigate and query. Um, you would not use this in a production environment. This is simply for kind of like testing, debugging, and in our case for il illustrative purposes. It gives us a way basically to look at the streaming data frame in flight, and we're going to use it for that, for that purpose. And you'll see that as we go through some of the the code examples. Structure streaming also has this concept of output nodes, uh, output modes, and specifically there are there are two of them. One is complete, means after you, that you you do a um, you know a, a transformation on your on your streaming data, what it's asking what gets written out to the to the sync or the external storage, and it could basically rewrite everything or it could be written in append mode. But as you can imagine, it, these are not all applicable to all cases. And in fact, in the, in the demo cases that we're going to go through, we're going to be using complete mode. And the reason for that being is that we're going to be creating, we're going to be doing counting, uh, we're going to be creating uh, aggregations uh, like, um, like, like averages. And you, those have to be rewritten, right? Because you have data coming in, and we'll, as you see, we'll be using like sliding windows. That data changes, so it has to kind of be written out. So in, in the in the cases that we're going to be look at, the output the output modes that we're going to have to use is a uh, complete mode. And as it says down here, different types of streaming queries support different output modes. It depends upon what you're doing, but the ones that we're going to be doing with like calculating averages and counts and things like that will require a, a complete mode. But I just wanted to let you know that append mode is another option there for the for the right use case and where it where it makes sense. So you can do any operation on a streaming data frame that you can do on a, a static data frame. So any kind of like SQL type operation, selects, where, group buys, and, and you'll see some of these as we go through the examples. Um, those are all open to you and, and you, you write the, uh, you know, the data, use the data frame API just like you would on a, a static data frame. It also lets you allows you to do RDD type of operation. So many of you have maybe are familiar with this, where you take a data frame and you want to do like row by row processing using the RDD uh, APIs like map and filter and so forth. And those are available to you also. I'm not going to be using those in those demo in the demos that we're going to look at, but I wanted to um, you know show you that those are available. Just again, anything that you could do. Uh, almost anything, and we'll talk about some of the limitations on a static uh, data frame you can do on a streaming data frame. Just uh, a few more words on this default tolerance semantics that we talked about. So again, in streaming, many people want this kind of end-to-end, -end, uh, once-only, exactly once semantics, and, and Spark Structure Streaming um, provides that under an, under any any fail mechanism. This is one of the primary goals behind uh, Spark Structured Streaming. So the Spark Structured Streaming, the sources, the sync, and the engine themselves are all set up so that they can track the process and then you know whenever a failure occurs, restart and reprocess the data from the appropriate point point. 
point in time. Again, that's as much as I'm going to say on this, except for the fact that it, it does utilize, um, you know, checkpointing and write ahead logs. And as you set up your structured streaming job, you know, you would have to define those for the purpose of the demos that we're going to see. I'm not using that. I'm not worried about, if, you know, just for illustrative purposes, um, exactly once processing, but those are available. Are, are for you to use. And again, once you define those, you don't have to worry, like I mentioned several times already, you don't have to worry about that that piece of it. Spark structured streaming takes care of that for you uh, without, you know, without you having to reason about it. All right, so let's move into uh, some of the examples. So I'm going to show you a little bit of it um, through Slideware first because I think it makes it easier to understand and then we'll look at it in code. So if you can imagine, here's a situation where we have data flowing in. Um, so it's multiple lines of uh, data with words on them, and we're basically going to try to do a word count. And, and, and the data is flowing in, and we're going to investigate it at certain uh, trigger points, say like T1, T2, and, and T3. And going back to that, when we looked at that you know, programming architectural diagram earlier, this is kind of an instantiation of it with like a, a real situation. We have this data flowing in, and then you can see the unbounded table. Um, you know, would just the, the the data would just be conceptually appended to the end of that, and then you can do your um, you know your transformations or aggregations or whatever you're doing in word counts, and then there you can see the results of what those um, would look like. Um, basically, we're just counting the words in each one. So this particular one had one da one do uh, one cat and three dogs. And you can see it did the word count there, and then we're going to output it. And this, um, in this case, it's saying to the console, we're going to write it to that memory table structure that I talked about, um, which will make us just kind of uh, available for us to uh, to write SQL queries against. Again, you'll see that as we go into the into the demo. So as I mentioned, you know, one of the things that Spark Structure Streaming really brings to the table is the ability to accommodate event times. So now here, imagine we have data coming off of some um, source, but in the data is embedded event time. So you can see, um, you know, these are time stamped and they're coming in at various times. And in this particular case, we're going to do word counts, but we're going to do them on a, um, a sliding window. We're going to do 10-minute sliding windows and then report the data every every five minutes. So Spark Structure, Spark Structure Streaming, as well as Spark Streaming, uh, the classic version actually allowed you to do um, these type of things, although it would have been a little bit more difficult to do this, and you didn't really have the, um, you know, the uh, native support for, for the um, timestamps that we, we talked about previously. But you can see as this data comes in, we have these various windows. Again, they're 10 uh, minute intervals of windows, re you know, reported on every five seconds. So you can see on this axis every five seconds, but the windows themselves are 10 seconds. So this, the first window we're reporting on is zero to 10 seconds. So all of this data right here would fall into that, into that window. And then it, it's, it's, it's counted up here. And then new data comes in at a different time um, that would fall within the um, you know the five to ten uh, minute interval um, so you can see that that yeah and actually both of the intervals the zero zero to ten and five to ten so both of those windows get get incremented with this additional word of owl and cat and then more data comes in and you basically get get the same thing so it's 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 investigating and we'll see how to do that in code it's investigating uh, the timestamp as a, as a particular column in these data frames and then using the uh, windowing functions within spark sql uh, to be able to allocate the uh, whatever you're doing in this case uh, whatever aggregation in this case count um, to the appropriate and only to the appropriate time windows all right, so the final thing that I wanted to uh, mention to you was uh, this whole idea of uh, late data. So it's one great thing to have timestamps, but what happens when my data doesn't arrive on time, right? So with classic Spark Streaming, you were at, kind of at the mercy whenever the data arrived. But I want to understand, well, if I'm doing time window aggregations and data arrives late, it could be networking issues, it, it could be what, forever. I want to get counted in the um, in the right bucket of uh, time windows. So here you can see the example here is this data coming in. This is the exact same example we had earlier, except this time um, this this word dog actually 
came in at like 12, 13, somewhere way out here, but it had a timestamp of 12.04. So in terms of windowing, it should be counted back here in the window that goes from, um, from like 12 to 12.10. And so what you can see as a result, what happens here is that is indeed the case as it doesn't show up in any of these because the data actually hasn't arrived yet. But when it does arrive, <coughs> excuse me, it, it shows up in the in the appropriate window and you can see that depicted here as 12 to 1210. Before we go on to the demo, the final thing that I wanted to mention to you and we're not going to look at this in, in code. In fact, this is a, it just came out in Spark 2.1.0, is this idea of watermarking. So as you can imagine, in order to, uh, as, as late data comes in, to be able to update the aggregation that you're doing, it has to maintain um, data, state data in, in memory. But you know, like what would happen if you're you're running this query like for days or stuff, right? It's 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 not feasible. That would all be in, um, uh, you know, would have to be maintained in memory. So what they did is they came up with this concept of a Spark came up with this concept of watermarking, which is basically telling after a certain amount of time, if the data arrives later than that, I'm going to ignore it. I don't care about it. It's it's too late. And so all this is is showing here, as you can see, this data coming in at various times. Um, and then it's also showing late data, but then we also defined a, a watermark, which means that after, after a certain amount of time, um, we would ignore that data. And that watermark, in terms of the, where the cutoff time is, this is event time on the y-axis, um, you know, increases with, as new data comes in. It's, it's, it's with respect to the latest data that came in. And so that's what kind of the staircase shows. And any data that came in like later than that watermark is basically ignored. So again, this is a way that to, um, you know, that you can specify after a certain amount of time that data is too late and I'm not going to count it anymore. And again, this allows you not to have to store all that state and memory, which after a, you know, a long amount of time is not going to be um, feasible. So let's talk a little bit about the demo. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what the, the flow of this whole thing is going to look like. So first, we're going to do a, a non-windowed example, just like we did in the um, in the uh, slides that we went through. So we're going to we're going to define a, a schema uh, and a stream, and then we're going to do the word count transformation. To and, and we're basically going to split the line into words, as you saw from the diagrams previously. There were multiple words on each line. Then we're going to group the data by words, and then we're going to compute the count of each group, with each group being a a single word. Then we're going to start a query that writes the running queries to this memory table that we discussed. Again, this is just for illustrative purposes. It allows us to investigate uh, the streaming data frame uh, in flight. And then we're going to read that memory table so that we can view that there were, um, you know, the word counts. And originally we're going to read it. There's going to be nothing there. And then we're going to create some data and view the word counts, and we'll see that come out. And then we're going to create more data and view the word count. So again, similar to the example, it's going to what I'm trying to instantiate in code is the um, the slide that we just we just went over. Then we're going to do the windowing example, and again the same steps as above. Although this time uh, the data itself is going to include event time, so there'll be a timestamp column. Uh, in the data, we're going to define a sliding window. So again, we're going to be doing things like we're going to um, we're going to be doing aggregations over 10-minute intervals, uh, but reported every every five minutes. And then the same thing, we're going to group the data, but this time we're not just grouping by word; we're grouping by window, so that we can see the re results on a on a window basis. And then we'll show that example of of late data. So this is the um, again this is a, a, a Jupyter notebook as as we um, kind of talked about before in data science experience. I'm running Python uh, with Spark 2.0. Again, structured streaming requires Spark uh, 2.0. And first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to run and uh, import any libraries uh, that we that we need, and I'm deleting any old data here. And this is the chart that we already saw. And then what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to define the schema for the data. So um, to make it kind of look, again, I'm trying to make it look like this picture. I'm, I'm trying to instantiate this picture in, in code. 
um, that th there is a, these data frames have a single column which I'm going to call line. They're of type string. So what I'm here is I'm I'm just defining what the uh, what the schema is for that that data frame. So I can land that data frame uh, in a in a directory as a part of a parquet file, and then we can we can use pick that Spark Streaming will pick that up and we'll view that as data as data streaming in. So you can Greg, see what's um, yeah. We have a question. Sure. Um, the question is, does all the incoming data live in memory in the form of an unbounded table? Uh, all the data, all the data, yes, is in, is, is in memory, yes. But is it in the form of an unbounded table? Well, unbounded table is kind of more of a con conceptual construct. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's that's the way to think about it. It is this, it's this, this um, you know, structured data frame structure that, that the the data actually is 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 stored in. Okay, thank you. All right. So what we're doing here is, so we have this. We have we're, we're defining the structure, and then we're going to use a um, we're going to use this operator called read stream. So this, if you were doing this with, um, with just data frames, it would just say read. So the only thing that changes here is we're doing read stream, and what the, the output of this is a, is a streaming data frame. So lines is a streaming data frame, and anything we operate on this from now on is a streaming data frame. So I'm saying use this streaming data frame. I'm going to apply the schema that we just defined. I'm going to write it out in Parquet format. And then I'm going to write it to this is I'm just giving it the name of of a directory, and the way that we're doing the word counts is just kind of like standard uh, Spark stuff. Is we're going to take that this is the streaming data frame. We're going to take the line column. We're going to spit on spaces. We're going to explode it so each line goes on a, a new row of the data frame. Then we're just going to select that for again from this this streaming data frame. We're going to just rename the uh, the column to word, and then now we have a new we have a new um. Oops, I didn't run that one. We'll, we'll have a new um, a streaming data frame uh, with those with, with those parameters. And then we're going to do the group by. So I'm going to take that words uh, data frame that we just created and 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 group by the the words which are in the word column. So the next thing we need to do is actually start a query that we're going to write to that memory table that we talked about. And so I'm taking the data frame that we just um, we just created uh, called word counts, and then we're going to write it as a stream. We're going to write it to a memory table. I'm giving the table a name so we can go ahead and query it with Spark SQL. We're going to write it as complete as I talked about before um, that we need to do complete because we're doing aggregates. Um, so I can go ahead and do that. And then once I have this memory table, again, this again for debug purposes or illustrative purposes, it resides on the Spark driver. I can go ahead and and query it. So this is just a standard SQL query. I'm just querying that data frame. I'm not doing any transformations here. The whole purpose of the SQL statements that I'll be showing you going forward are strictly to view what's in that memory table so that we can see what's going on. But all the transformations, all the aggregations will be done in um you know, on the in, in Spark structure streaming using using standard data frame uh, APIs. And so if we go ahead and, and now go ahead and look at that, um, there is no, you'll see it comes back with nothing. There is no data there because I did not drop any data uh, into that into that directory yet. So now what we're going to do is let's go ahead and create some data. So I'm all I'm doing here is this is just creating a data frame that has two lines in it, one cat dog, one dog dog, and a column called line. Um, I'm going to save it to the directory called animals, and I'm just going to keep appending this on uh, because I want to just drop this into as part of that parquet file um, that we're picking up to read in a kind of a streaming fashion. And now once I, I did that, if I go ahead and um, did I execute that? I don't know if I executed it. If I go ahead and, and run it, nope, I didn't execute it yet. If I go ahead and run it, it will create this data frame. It will drop it in the file. And now when I go ahead and, and actually run the same query that we did before, and again, investigating that, that um, memory table, you can see that uh, data actually does, does show up there. 
And so again, this is I'm basically what I'm mimicking back is this this picture right here. I'm creating these these this data at certain points in time, and then looking at it, at, you know, doing the streaming the streaming aggregation. So here, right here, we're just adding uh, uh, more lines, the owl, the cat, uh, as as kind of shown, as kind of shown right back up here. And then we'll do we'll do more aggregations on that. So once once we added it, um, we can then go ahead and um, and investigate the memory table with SQL, and you could see that um, you know those those items were added. And then again, in the same fashion, we could add more data. And then as if we go ahead and then and then investigate the memory table again, we'll see that those were were added in. So all we're doing at this point is that we as data gets dropped into that directory animals it's picked up by spark streaming as streaming data and then we did the group <clears throat> by transformations to count the words put it in a memory table so that we can investigate it and then we're just doing spark sql against that Rick, so now we question. can move up yeah sure do you run spark on hadoop this is again running in IBM's data science experience, which is a uh, a cloud based uh, a cloud based platform Spark Spark instance. So this is not on a necessarily on a, a Hadoop cluster, but it could be. I mean, there's no reason why it couldn't be. I'm just I'm telling you, this is just the platform. We again we're using IBM's data science experience as the as the platform for a demo platform for what I'm showing you here. All right. So the next example is uh, with with windowing. Again, you saw this picture up here before. Um, so we're going to do I'm just going to clean up and make sure there's nothing in those directories. <coughs> we're going to define the schema uh, for the um, for the for the streaming read again. Uh, except this time, it looks exactly the same. Except now, rather than just having one column called line, we also have an additional one called timestamp. Uh, and so we'll go ahead and, and define that. And then the other thing is because now this is a sliding window aggregation, we need to create a sliding window. So I need to define two parameters, sliding window and slide du duration. I'm going to make the sliding window 10 minutes, and I'm going to make the sliding uh, sliding size five five minutes. And you can see the um, the units there. So we can we can go ahead and do that. And then we're going to split the words exactly like we did above. And then we're going to do a group by exactly like we did above, although the only difference here is now in addition to grouping by word, which is what we did before, we're also grouping by um, the, um, the event time. And so this is not particular to structured streaming. Um, this is part of, of Spark SQL is it has these window and functions. But like I said, you can use the same APIs that you can against static data and structured data um, so I can use these same windowing functions. And all this is saying is that I, in, the, in my data frame, I have a column called timestamp that I'm going to window on, and I'm going to give it the window duration and slide du duration, and I'm grouping by that as well as, 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 well as the, um, the word column, which has the split, the split words that, that we did above. And then like we did before, I'm going to stuff this into a memory table. This is all the same thing uh, that we did in the, uh, in the, we did in the other case. Uh, and then we can go ahead and, and look at the, um, we can look at the data and there's nothing there yet, right? This is kind of like what we saw before. Now I can start creating some data. Um, so again, I'm going to create the schema for my, for my um, created data. Again, same as what we just saw. It just has a timestamp and a line column in it. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and, and create the data. So this time you can see the data actually has um, the timestamps in it. Um, so we can go ahead and do that. And then all I'm going to do here is go ahead and, and query it. And you can kind of view this as your own at your own uh, time after you get the notebook. So it looks kind of complicated. Um, but all I'm doing is setting it up um, so that I can I can bucket it into into various windows. All I want you to know you know take away from this is I'm just querying that memory table so that I can look at the various windows and basically I want it to come you know to look like this the results to look like the um you know this this picture over here which is why I I went through went through all of that. So if we go ahead and run it, you can see that it you know it counted and and 
where where um you know cat and dog came in at uh you know at at a particular point in time at at, at time zero you know it fit within the um, you know zero to zero to ten minutes and then we can go ahead and add we can add more data uh, and then we can uh, again I'm kind of going through this fast but you can go back and look at those pictures and all of the data yeah. depending upon when it comes in uh, will go into the appropriate bucket uh, to be counted. Yes, Anna. There's uh, there are two questions. One is, can we have timestamps in the Unix format? Uh, yeah, as long as you um yeah yes you you can. And the other one is, what if data arriving late can be accessible in next sliding window? Yeah, it will be. So when it when it does the aggregations, um, whatever sliding window is appropriate for that aggregation, uh, it will it will um, it will show up there. So when you do when I'm doing like these these um, these counts, you know wherever it shows up and whatever sliding window it should be in, it's it's part of this this count tally. That that's the whole idea behind behind timestamps is that it will it will bucket into the the, the timestamps that you you define as you know for for group by and, and this pertains that I'm grouping by as as part of my counting. Okay, thank you. All right, and then not to belabor this, but I'm you know just adding more data. And again, it, it's tough to see this. You can go back and look at these, but all of the items that I'm bringing in again, basically to mimic um, this diagram right here, you know, they all get and I'm instantiating this in code. Um, they all get put into the uh, you know to the to the proper buckets and get counted accordingly based upon the uh, the timestamp. And the data may reside in multiple timestamps. Um, because if it if it falls within like these go from five to fifteen and ten to to twenty, if you know data that came in at at, at uh, thirteen minutes will actually be in both of these buckets, and both of them in this case did get um, did get counted accordingly. Um, so just quickly, the, the, this is the um, the late data one. So all I want to show you from here, this is exact. I'm just going to go through this really quick because this is exactly the same as um as as what as as what we did. We get we get no data. We add some data, and I'm adding the exact same data that we did above. So I'm just kind of running through these cells, but there's there's nothing uh, nothing new here um, until we get to this this last piece. And so again, going back like up here, the difference here now is we have data. This this dog oops this dog right here. It's time stamped at 12:04. It's really time stamped way back here, but it's coming in at like round 12, 12, 13. And the only piece that I wanted to um, um, to show you from this, and here you can see I have this annotated, so this dog is coming in at four minutes, um, and then it's it's also coming in with this owl, uh, which is at 13 minutes. But what is going to happen is when um, you actually do the windowing, it's it's because it has that time event embedded in it, it actually puts that that dog it incremented so although it came in sometime at 13 which was way past this window this window went from 0 to 10 minutes it actually incremented dog there because that's where it belongs according to the uh, to the window um, and then it does not belong because it, it does not fall within 5 to um, it does not fall within 5 to 15 or 10 to 20 um, it did not get aggregated aggregated there and again, this could go on forever, but then that goes back to the watermarking that I talked about, where you can set the watermarking so after a certain amount of time, this stuff came in so late, um, you would ignore it. So again, bottom line is this allows you to do these window aggregations fairly easily, um, which would not have been possible or very easily possible with um, kind of more of the, the classic structured streaming. All right, so what I want to just quickly show you is um, one more example. I know I'm rushing through this. I'm trying to get in all the uh, the material here. Uh, so what we're going to do is a, an example here where we're going to generate uh, streaming sensor data every five seconds that's going to be time stamped, and it's going to have temperature and humidity data. And then we're going to look at it. We're going to do static analysis on that data, just like using standard data frames that everyone you know may have already been been using. We're going to query and plot the static data, uh, but then we're going to look at it from a streaming perspective, um, like we just did the in these examples, except that we're going to be doing rather than counting, 
uh, we're going to do be um, doing rolling averages, and we'll be we'll be plotting those. And then finally, I just wanted to show you one other capability um, that we'll actually be joining. I'll show you how to join that a streaming data frame can actually be joined to a uh, to a static data frame, and I'll show you an example of that. So this is the way the data is going to look like, um, and we'll, we'll, see, we'll see this in more detail. I'll show you how I generate it. But it's basically going to be a data frame that has a um, oops, that has a sensor ID, a timestamp. Um, this is just a generated column. I just pulled the seconds out of the timestamp so it was easy to see. And then we're going to be creating some random temperatures and and humidities. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute how I <coughs> excuse me how I do that. All right, so I'm going to flip over to this. So the way I, I constructed this is there are two separate notebooks. The one we're looking at here is the one that's going to actually generate the data. Um, so all I'm going to do is just delete and make sure I got everything uh, gone. I'm going to import all the uh, required libraries. And here we're going to generate the data. So all I, this, this cell, all it does is take input. How much, how long do you want it to run, run for? And um, you can you can input the number, or I also have it um, so that you could it would just default to um, to, to to 15 uh, minutes. Uh, it's not really going to ask you for much because it's not um, uh, you know I didn't put like try accept uh, you know statements in here to to kind of check for error. This was just sort of quick and dirty. Although I'm not sure why it's not uh, running right now, I may need to restart my kernel. Let me just try to um, hopefully that'll fix it. Let me just try to do that. It may have timed out. I'm not sure why it's not connecting, but let me um, let me explain explain to you the logic of, of what we had being here. So the way it's supposed to work, and if you download these, hopefully we can um, uh, you can get it you can get it working. Uh, so again, it, it asks you to input how how long you want to run it for, and so here's what I'm what I'm doing here. I'm basically just from your input, I'm calculating how long you want to do it. So that inputs in minutes, I'm converting it to seconds by multiplying by 60, and then I'm calculating an end time, which would be the current time, that's what this, this function will give me, and then I'm adding the, um, the duration to it to get the end time. And then what I do is I create a uh, basically a while loop, and then I'm saying, because this is going to actually run in real time, if we can get it running here, that while the, um, you know, while the while the current time is less than the end time, what we're going to do is we're going to create a data frame, and I'm going to use the Python list to do that. I'm going to create a, um, uh, a sensor ID number, and in this case, I'm only using one for simplicity. We could have had multiple sensors. Uh, and then I uh, just define an empty list, and then I'm using the, you know, just uh, Python random functions to create a range of values, random range of values for temperature uh, between 70 and 100. And then a um, a range of values uh, for humidity uh, that are between uh, between 70 and 90, uh, and then um, I'm basically just appending these all together into the list as we iterate through it, and then we're going to um, create the we're going to uh, convert these into a data frame. So I'm defining the schema here. It's going to have um, it's going to have three columns. It's going to have the sensor ID. It's going to have the uh, uh, the temperature, which is type integer, and the uh, humidity, which is uh, of type integer, and all this is just saying that they could be they could be null values. And then I go ahead and create a data frame out of that using using the schema that we just defined above. But then the other thing is I do is I append a timestamp uh, column onto this. So I <laughs> I take the um, I take the current time, so again, as this is running and generating data in real time, I'm appending it to a column 
uh, called timestamp, and then I'm, I'm casting that to make sure it's a, a real timestamp uh, value. And then I'm writing this. This is kind of just like what we did before when, like, in line in the data frame, we were creating data in, in line in the notebook, the previous notebook in the cells, we were creating a data frame. Here we're creating it, and then I'm dropping it into a, um, you know, I'm dropping it into a, uh, a directory as, as parquet files uh, called timestamp sensor, timestamp sensor data. And that's all we need, and then we're going to go look at it in the other notebook. All I'm doing here is I'm I'm reading I'm reading it back. This is just so that you can kind of see what's going on. It has really nothing to do with the thing, but the idea is that it would it would print out down here below um, what is what is happening. And as as you can see, you get you get a sensor ID, a timestamp. Um, I just pulled out the seconds. That's just a derived column so that you could see it, and then a random temperature and humidity value. And it's supposed to be every five. It's every five seconds because I'm sleeping for five seconds. It takes a little time uh, to ramp up, but once it kind of gets ramped up, you can see these are approximately uh, five or six, uh, five or six seconds apart. Let me see if this will. Um, we may need to give up on this and kind of just walk through it if it won't if it won't run. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm not. I'm not sure why it's not running at this point. But we can go over, and I have. You can. You can kind of see the uh, the results. So this is the this is the analysis. So here, I I imported the libraries that we need, uh, and then we're just going to do standard data frame static analysis. So again, this is not, you can see this is just a read. It's not a read stream. So I, I'm looking at the Parquet files that are in, in this directory, and then I'm just going to go ahead and select the, uh, you know, the, the data that I want, which was that's, this is what we generated in the other notebook. We're dumping in a file uh, in, a, in a directory that both of these notebooks can read from. Um, so we have sensor ID, timestamp, temperature, humidity, um, and then we can go ahead and, and see that there. So this is just the raw data that was um, that was dumped into that directory as Parquet files, and then I'm just going to do a um, calculate an average uh, you know temperature with a, a, a 20 second sliding window. As I mentioned before, these window and functions are part of the uh, data frame and Spark SQL APIs. Um, so you can do these on static data frames, but then as you also saw, we can run these in, uh, you know, on, on top of date, uh, streaming data frames. So all I'm doing is I'm, I'm just, um, I'm just going to group by the sensor ID, a window which is a 20-second uh, sliding window uh, reported every every 10 seconds, and then here you can see I'm doing an aggregation. I'm actually av aggregating and averaging the temperature into a column called average temperature and then humidity into a column called average humidity. Uh, and then I'm just sticking it in a, uh, a, a temporary table or view um, so that we could um, we could run Spark SQL against it. And then here you can see, again, I'm not doing any aggregations in the Spark SQL statement. Uh, all it's basically doing is just pulling back the information uh, that is in that uh, memory table, uh, but I'm just kind of formatting it uh, the way I want. Uh, by getting the uh, you know putting it in in in, in organized in, in terms of windows and here you can see what the uh, what the data looks like so again this is all just nothing to do with spark streaming this is just all standard um, data frame manipulation using the data frame apis and and spark sql and then I could plot the data here I'm just showing it plotted <coughs> using that plot map plot lib and you can you can see the results so we could also look at this, and then again, this is the whole point of it, looking at it from a, a streaming uh, perspective. So this should look pretty familiar to you at this point. So the way that we need to do now is rather than just reading it like we did above, um, we need to uh, read stream. And again, I'm providing the schema for that, which is like the same schema that we had above. It has the sensor ID, timestamp, temperature, and, and humidity. Uh, and then I'm <coughs> reading you know, the, the parquet files that are dropped into that directory. Um, called timestamp sensor data. Um, that's again, that's the directory that we used in the uh, other notebook that we were generating the uh, the data under. And then you can see I, I didn't show these in the other ones, but there's a bunch of methods that come with streaming data frames. So I can, here I can show you 
that it is definitely a, a streaming data frame. There's a method called it is, is streaming. It comes uh, back as true. And then I can go ahead and do some aggregations against that. So this is similar to what we've we've already seen. So against that streaming data frame, I'm doing a uh, a, a group by, and then I'm uh, you know group buying sensor ID, and then again the window which is um, on that on that timestamp, which is the event time column, 20 second sliding windows every 10 seconds, and then I'm aggregating temperature uh, and and humidity. And then, so again, now I have, this is, a, again, a streaming data frame in order to investigate it and look at it. I am going to write it to that, that memory table structure, again, just for illustrative purposes. You would not do this in, in production, but I'm going to stick it in a memory table um, called streaming table. Um, and then there's another method here that you can actually, if you wanted to determine what the, uh, the name of the uh, query was, it's just called um, name. I was just kind of showing that here. And then once we have that memory table, like we did on the, on the other example, we can go back in and just run uh, SQL queries against it. So all I'm here is I'm, I'm just running, uh, you know, a SQL query to select out that data and, um, and then just order it by the, um, you know, by the, uh, the window time and the, and, the, uh, and the sensor ID. And these are the re raw results. Uh, and then I can, again, just like we did before, I can, um, I can go ahead and, and, and plot them. The thing I want you to get away from you from this is the the top part of this notebook and the bottom part were essentially the same, right? The only thing I did is I changed read, which is what you know typically people are familiar with uh, data frames uh, to read stream, uh, so that I could I could read from a a uh, streaming data stream. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know why the uh, other notebook just doesn't seem to be running. I need that to generate the data. Um, it would have been more impactful because what I could have showed you here is I continually, if I would have continually run this cell, um, as data flows in, the graph would have got continually more and more populated. You would have, you would, you would, you would have started out with one one bar of um, memory of uh, of average temperature and average humidity, and then after 10 seconds, it would have been two bars and three bars, and we would have been able to watch it in real time uh, as it as it grew out as data continued to uh, to stream into the environment. Unfortunately, as a part of a live demo, it just uh, just didn't work out. But hopefully, if you can download these, um, it should work. I just had it working uh, earlier this morning, and uh, you, if you have any problems, you can you can let us know. Final thing that I just wanted to show you is the ability to join a static data frame uh, to a streaming data frame. So here I am, I'm going to create a new data frame um, and it has these sensor IDs um, and this is the one we're working with and I'm, I'm going to say that it was located in, uh, it was located in Boston and here's the, the, the streaming data frame. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to join that, um, this is a static data frame, I'm going to join this to a streaming data frame. So to that streaming data frame that we had up, uh, up above called um, average streaming data frame, I'm going to join this data frame right here called local uh, location data frame and I'm going to join on the sensor ID uh, key. So as you, as you remember when we were doing these, this, this, this data frame had a sensor ID key and then we could go ahead and, and join on that key. Um, we're going to stuff it again like we've done already 10 times. We're going to stuff it in a uh, memory table so that we get access to look at it. And then we're just going to um, run a SQL query against that in memory table and look at the results. And again, what I want you to see out of this is um, all of this first part of it right here was the same uh, table uh, that we had above, but now with the join, um, we added this location data, which was Boston, um, which did not exist as you, as you saw up here. It did not exist in the original uh, the original table here. It came out of the um, the static table uh, that we created right here. And it, there was only one. We were only working with one sensor. If we had create generated uh, uh, simulated data for each of the sensors, they would all would have been in here, and then you would have seen the uh, the various locations. So just to wrap things up, yeah, sure, Anna. Um, one is, does structure streaming replace spark streaming? 
All right, can, can we hold that one second as I go through the last slides? Hopefully that will start to answer it and I will, I will um, incorporate that answer into that. And if I don't, at the end of the next two slides, let me know. Okay. That's just exactly uh, the next right. one is, what about debugging best practices? Any new features to Spark GUI to help? That I am, I, I, I'm not familiar with. We can maybe get you more answers with them. I, I, I just have not worked with that myself, unfortunately. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, and, right. and then we'll address all right. so the questions yeah. after you wrap up. All right. So, um, current limitations of Spark Structure Streaming. So, I, I told you a lot about it. I think it has a lot of great offerings. Um, why or why you may not want to use it? Well, at this point, it's it's still labeled as Alpha in Spark 2.1 and the APIs are still experimental. So in, in terms of that question, when to use and when not to use, um, I you can use Spark Structure Streaming kind of more of as a, you know, kind of for investigation at this point and then uh, with an eye on future products, I would not use it for a production uh, deployment because it's it's still labeled as alpha and it's, it's again, subject to change. Um, so Right now, if you have streaming applications you want to deploy, use what I was called classic structured streaming. This is the future. This is the direction. This is where all the streaming development is going. Uh, but as of right now, um, use classic structured streaming for uh, production. Use this for things where you can, um, if you just want to get familiar with the technology, and then you have things that aren't mission critical, and you can, you want to do the kind of investigation that we were doing here. Um, I would encourage, I would encourage that. Um, some other limitations: it only has a limited number of built-in sources and output syncs. Um, specifically, if we look at like some of the output syncs, well, some of the things that we can't do that it's really needed is to be able to, you know, you do those transformations on the streaming data set. I want to sync those to a um, a relational database like uh, PostgreSQL or whatever it is, the you know the JDBC connection on the output sync that does not exist yet. It's something that they're working on. Hopefully, will be there shortly, uh, but is is not there. And then finally, not all operations are applicable on static data frames are supported in streaming data frames. Not some of them they just haven't got around to do yet. So it's a work in progress, and they'll be supported in future releases. Um, some of them are hard to implement on streaming data efficiently. So you can you you know you can uh, imagine like doing things like um, sorting is difficult because it requires keeping tracking of all the all the data so that you could sort them. So whether that ever comes to fruition, I don't know. Uh, but then when you look at kind of like the notable unsupported operations um, that are as again the latest uh, version of Spark, Spark 2.1, is that you cannot do multiple streaming aggregations. So that you cannot chain aggregations together in a streaming uh, uh, on a streaming data frame. Um, you could definitely do multiple transformations, but they can't be uh, multiple uh, aggregations. You own, only one is, is allowed. Again, that is something that you can currently do in classic uh, uh, Spark streaming. So if you needed that, I mean, this would, you know, it could certainly be addressed in the current product, but in the structured streaming, uh, that's something that's still being uh, worked on. And then you can, um, uh, you cannot join uh, be the same. This is the same thing. It exists in streaming, but not in structured streaming yet. You cannot join between two streaming data sets. So I showed you an example of uh, uh, joining a streaming data frame to a, a static data frame that is supported, but two stream and obviously two static data frames. That's been it. That's nothing to do with structured streaming. That's supported, but uh, joining between one, a multi, two or a more. Uh, structured streaming data frames that is currently not supported uh, on the user list and stuff. Um, a lot of people keep asking for that, so I, I think it's a. It, I don't have the Jira in front of me, but I think it's a, a it's a high priority item, and so hopefully that will be uh, coming out soon. Um, and I, so I hope if 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 I didn't answer the question about you know when to use this or why not you know over uh, structured streaming again for production environments use the classic structured streaming. Um, this has a lot of nice features in it, but it's it's experimental at, at this point. So use it for investigation and for like you know non mission critical things where you just want to kind of work with the data with some of the new uh, features that are avail available here things like timestamps. Uh, event times and, and things of that nature.
So just to wrap up, um, you know, what did we explore in this session? We looked at some of the li limitations of classic um, Spark structured streaming, the fact that it did not support things like uh, event time, the, ev the, the fact that it, it didn't necessarily guarantee um, you know, fault tolerance and exactly once processing and that you would need to handle all of that, you know, in, in your code. Um, the fact that the, um, you know, the existing Spark stream, classic Spark streaming, the uh, APIs were not necessarily consistent with working with, with um, RDDs, where this one, it's a, and hopefully this came through, if I want you to take anything away, is that whenever we worked on a streaming data set, the API was exactly the same as for a static data frame. The queries against them were exactly the same, had to change nothing. The only thing that you need to change is when you create the data frame, rather than say read, you need to say uh, read, read stream. Um, and so structured streaming enables streaming analytics without you having to reason about it, as we talked about the fault tolerance, the uh, exactly once processing, all taken care of you um, under the covers, and then it you know it supports the um, you know because of the having the event time capabilities you can uh, you can do these time windowing functions and all these windowing functions that are in Spark SQL um, you can easily use them uh, with structured streaming and then you can uh, you know you can accommodate late data and then um, out of order data because the timestamps in there and then with the we didn't show this here but I talked about it you know with the um, watermark functions you will be able then to set a uh, you know a boundary in terms of how late the uh, the data can be so Anna that's all that I had I don't know if there were any uh, lingering questions I know we're a little bit over yeah, there was another question. I kind of feel like you answered it, but it says, assume we have a table data frame suitable stream. When or why might one want to stick to using Spark Classic streaming? I, I, I yeah, I think I, I think I answered those right. It was the, this is not. I don't want to say it's not ready for prime time. It's again. It, it's, it, it really is not recommended for production deployments at, at, the, at this point in time. That will change hopefully uh, pretty soon. And then again, all the developments here, as you know, just the Spark in general has been moving from um, you know, RDDs to data frames. So if you look at like another example, like the uh, machine learning libraries, I mean, these were all originally RDD based. Now they're all structured stream, uh, they're all um, data frame based. Um, that's the same case here, moving from RDDs and DStreams uh, to structured streaming. And eventually those two have to marry together so that you could have like, you know, streaming in streaming data frames, um, you know, working uh, directly with the, um, the new machine learning APIs that, that depend upon uh, a, a data frame format. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Rick, for your presentation, and thank you everyone who joined us. Again, uh, you will receive an email uh, within the next 24 hours with a link to the recording. And we'll share a presentation and notebooks. And uh, I also invite you to download the handout as it has information about a couple of uh, webinars that are coming up. Thank you so much. Thank you.